Yeah, I don't know enough about it to complain about it I yet. Think, I think this one <laughs> might be about the Spanish Inquisition. I, I did not that. expect the Spanish Inquisition. Well, well nobody does. Go. Nobody does. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris ask what attributes in films help evoke the feel of video games. Plus, Doc talks The Witcher 3, Jim talks Earthbound, and the crew reacts to Metal Gear Survive. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 76 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, y'all. And we're joined by Doc. 76 was a really good year. A lot of good people were born in 1976. I was thinking 1776. Oh. Well. The, the year that democracy was born. Mm. Oh. Well, yeah. in that case, a lot of people were born on the uh, bicentennial <laughs> of this great country. Mm, there you go. Anyway, hi, everybody. <laughs> and of course, I'm, I'm joking about democracy being born. I know it existed in other forms before the U.S. Anyway, Jim, what? how about you uh, tell us about no. our media discussion for today? Yeah, today we're going to talk about um, what attributes a film should have in order to evoke the feel of a video game. I prefer attributes. Uh, yes, attributes, attributes. I'm going to pronounce it the way I want to pronounce it, which is the correct way. <laughs> attribute is a verb. Yes. Attribute is a, is a noun. Mm, exactly. I don't think that's accurate. Don't make me come over there and kick your attribute. (laughs) I don't think that's accurate. So, um, (laughs) I don't think I could, Mr. Judo. Um, okay. So, uh, I think one thing that I want to make sure that we don't assume going into this is that this is not really about an adaptation of a video game to film or vice versa. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, no, because that's been tried a lot and often failed. I'm talking more about trying to evoke the feeling that one gets when playing a video game or um, when experiencing a video game world, but doing so in film. Mm -hmm. But first, uh, we're going to start off with a button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Jim, for allowing me to experience the excitement and uh, glory that is being a Witcher. Mm. Uh, Specifically, I'm talking about Witcher 3. It's a little bit of a strange experience because I have not played Witcher 1 or 2, but it makes me want to go back and kind of find Witcher 2 and play it. Um, I have to say, right out of the gate, it does a really good job of drawing you into the story. It does not make you feel like uh, you're a bozo for not having played the other games, Mm -hmm. especially since they're all on other consoles and and platforms and stuff. It's kind of hard to track down the first one, even. But that said... um, they, they did some really nice things uh, along the way, kind of in the KOTOR style of asking you questions about the plot from the other games, since I didn't have a safe file to import, you know, and that kind of a thing. Um, but I really would rather talk about the, the gameplay itself and what I really like about the gameplay. First of all, it doesn't hold your hand, um, and it is most certainly uh, a little bit punishing in the sense that uh, if you're not doing a, a thing intelligently, you're going to feel it. Mm-hmm. And and what I mean by that is, um, let's say you need to go up against a werewolf. Well, what you need to do is you actually need to go get some cursed oil, put it on your blade. You need to make sure you've got the right potions brewed. You need to make sure that you have rested and meditated. And then you need to go confront the thing at the right time of day and in the right place, realizing that you're going up against a werewolf and he probably will have some wolves with him. Do you want to take him in his cave? Do you want to lure him from his cave? Are you going to do it on his own territory? That kind of a thing. Um, what I like about that, and the way that I feel that is very, very different from um, something like uh, one of those one of those soul games that I hate so much. Uh, what, are, what are the ones that the Dark pun- Souls? Dark Souls, yeah. There you go. Uh, how I feel that that's very different is that uh, I feel like I'm in the sandbox and I can do this in my own uh, my own way. I'm mm-hmm. not having to discover it um, because uh, I, the player, don't know it, and it's trial and error. Instead, what it is, is I can go research this in-game. I can um, get it into my bestiary in-game. And then as a part of that, I can prepare. And I really like that idea that 
um, the story actually lends itself into the Witcher himself knowing how to um, be a werewolf. I'm actually comparing this a lot to Skyrim, and mm-hmm. I think this is the game Skyrim kind of wanted to be, in a sense. Um, and in another sense, not so much, because in Skyrim, you start with a blank slate, and you pour yourself into the character. I choose the face, I want to look like a cat, I want to look like an elf, I want to look like a whatever. No, no, no. You are playing as the Witcher. It's, it's Geralt. Geralt. That's your Geralt. 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 Geralt of Rivia. Geralt of Rivia. Uh, I mean, so which, uh, how yeah, do you know yeah. it's 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 Khajiit. Um, calling them cats is very insensitive. Oh, sorry. I am, yeah. I am extremely triggered right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, well you can just go. Uh, Chris is a furry. You can go, <laughs> you can, you can, you can go to your cat box yeah. then. Uh, sorry, your Khajiit box. Khajiit know that many things. <laughs> wow. Uh, at any rate, what what I really like about the Witcher games uh, as I've been playing them is this whole idea of um, what what we in the academic world call a stock character. You know, you, whenever you sign up to play a God of War game, you're playing as Kratos. Whenever you sign up to play a, uh, uh, you know, a Legend of Zelda game, you're playing as Link mm-hmm. or Zelda by, by some people's standards, <laughs> right? Uh, but then therein, therein lies the joke. Uh, but whenever you're playing The Witcher, you're playing as Geralt. Mm-hmm. And and I think that that's wonderful. And, and one of the things that I really have not been able to get into in Skyrim type games is, you know, who is my character? Am I role playing? Even to the point of, of fallout lately, kind of losing myself in the emptiness of the character Mm -hmm. um, and choosing to, to have to fill that with my own role play within the context. Um, I I honestly think it's kind of why I washed out of world of Warcraft and, and why some of these other games just don't work for me. But, the idea of Geralt's story is really driving me forward. I feel like he has relationships, meaningful relationships with people, mostly large-breasted women, in this world. And therefore, I should, you know, as a player, be interested in that and go forward. So I think that really plays in and ties into our topic today, uh, at least in part, which is what is that um, that gameplay experience that, that you want to get from a, a good uh, film that, that makes you remind you of, of video games. And I, the big challenge that I'm going to throw out for us to think about before we get to our meaty topic is, are we talking about mechanics or are we talking about story? Oh, yeah. Because and I think that's a great thing to talk and I And I honestly, I would I would like to sort of touch on both. Yeah, I, I agree. I think those are, those are different things that in video games have to work in tandem if you want to have a Absolutely. successful game. So anyway, to, to close up on Witcher here, I think The Witcher understands what type of game it is. It's a fighting game, but it also does, is not shy about the fact that, you know what, if you go into this area, you are going to die. Mm-hmm. It doesn't level up the enemies slowly, that kind of a thing. You need to prep, you need to level, you need to do your stuff, you need to do your homework. Actually, um, you know, Picking flowers is meaningful. Mm-hmm. It's not just meaningless gathering. Or you can not do that at all and go get yourself a nice sword, sell it, uh, go to the herbalist and just buy what you need. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And if there's a rare thing, it's probably on a quest somewhere. But I'm really enjoying the way I feel like everything I've done, even a side quest, has been meaningful in that game. And it has been so refreshing. Um, that said, and, the the story is quite compelling and very enjoyable. And it's uh, probably the, the game that I have enjoyed the most in the last couple of years, uh, story-wise, mm-hmm. even more so, like I said, than Fallout. And I couldn't figure out why until I, I what I just said. The story is actually written, and it is a produced storyline that is leading me towards an eventual win on Geralt's because he's gonna he's gonna win he's awesome he's this he's mm-hmm. great guy you know so I know I know oh, he's the good guy and he's gonna be victorious and I will warn you there are multiple endings of course and, there are and what you do in the game has an effect of course it does and and I gotta say this is a game that is uh, for adults oh, yeah. as well I did not fully recognize how true that was until I got to the scene where uh, one of the ladies was trying to seduce me and uh, hit the button thinking there'd be a nice cut scene and we'd walk away and no no I had to shield my eyes <laughs> uh, in fact I, I technically reloaded uh, so I could make a different decision <laughs> because uh, I, I'm actually trying to make sure that the love uh, story that's in there as well with Yennefer, I believe it is, is is a main... It, it's a choice. So. Um, the game gives you a choice essentially between uh, Yennefer and Triss. Right. Or you can do... Or you can... You can try to seduce them both, but... Right. Well, I mean, this this game like... Um, like Grand Theft Auto, um, it has, you know, prostitutes and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. So, it, I, I was 
quite surprised at the level of mm-hmm. uh, uh, interactivity, shall we say, mm-hmm. that's available. And there's uh, multiple p- characters as well. I mean, you mentioned the women, but as you start getting into the game, I mean, and plus in the tutorial part, mm-hmm. um, you, you, you're riding with another Witcher. So right, there you are. Which we just we talked about tutorials on our last show and yeah, sort of how they're handled and. Um, I thought Witcher Three did such a great job because oh, it's brilliant t- tutorial just it just feels like like a prologue to a to a story that you're reading. That's right, with flashbacks and everything. Yeah. Um. Well, and and the Baron, um, that's in the starting area and and how he was a wife beater and all these other mm-hmm. things and a drunk and all of this. Those characters feel so well thought out and so well written and it's just oh it's delicious it's, so, it's full of round characters yeah it it's is full of it. i don't i don't feel like the, there's a meaninglessness to the actions that i'm taking like i do so often in video games mm-hmm. it's like yeah okay sure i, I just killed 100 people but you know i'm playing assassin's creed i'm an assassin that's what i do um you know and and, and that whole thing we've talked about before like in uh, mad max and whatnot of the, the the guilt of killing all these people no i, I really feel like um, when someone stops me and says um witcher we don't like you and we don't want you in my town. And he's like, you need to, to leave right now or I'm going to kill you all. Um, if I can in any way avoid saying that, like like trying to, to use mind control on them or anything mm-hmm. to get them to walk away without me killing them. But no, uh, it half the time it ends up with them being like, uh, no, we're, we're, we're taking you down. And it, it hurts. I mean, I feel those deaths, those yeah. human deaths. Um, I'm a monster hunter. I'm not a, I'm not a murderer. It's cool. It's cool. So anyway, Witcher Three, a great game, but uh, don't let your kids play it. Seriously, oh, no. don't. No, I warned. I warned you. I you guess did. you didn't you totally did. believe me. No, at I first, did. But. I, I did not fully <laughs> believe you, but I have reloaded that save, and and now uh, Geralt at least yeah. still has virgin it, eyes. Though uh, I'm not sure I do it, anymore. <laughs> it's a. It is a game that is mature in both ways. It is mature in the sense of it has content that kids shouldn't be looking at, like you know, nudity and some extreme violence. But it mm-hmm. also is mature in the sense that the storytelling I think is, is That's mature. very true. That's very true, yeah. Which a lot of a lot of games that are rated mature are not mature in that way. That's true. Actually. That is a good point. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. So I actually sprained my thumb while at uh, Jiu Jitsu a couple of days ago. And so I've been kind of unable to play a lot of the video games that I, I typically like to play because my my left thumb is immobile essentially. Um, so I've been playing or looking at playing some RPGs, since uh, particularly uh, turn-based RPGs, because those don't really require um, Twitch control. Mm-hmm. So I've gone back and I've started playing um, Earthbound for the Super Nintendo, a game that I've heard a lot about, but I've actually never played. Hmm. Um, I know about the game, I kind of know what it's about, but I was a little curious to see. You know, hey, is this an interesting game? And, and to be honest, I'm still not quite sure if it if if it will appeal to me yet. Um, I've gotten to the point where um, I, I've essentially essentially you're a kid, which you can you can change your names, but you're Ness basically. Um, you're inside this you know sleepy town, a meteorite or meteorite crashes. Um, you go out to investigate. And um, you have to come back, and you find out. Okay, well, things have changed in this world. You start to develop psychic abilities, and um, you are allowed essentially by your mom for some reason. And, and the and the game is very very aware of this, which I think is what makes it work. Um, of how ridiculous the situation mm-hmm. is, you go out to sort of explore the world and sort of become the hero. Um, but the game is very meta, and it, it basically jokes about RPG conventions regularly Mm -hmm. and one of the things that is funny given how early in the industry it was relatively speaking relatively yeah but i thought it was actually it's very clever um what it does like for example one of the first things that you encounter as you're when when you first explore this character when you go to the meteor um it's a fly the fly's name is buzz buzz and yes because it's a fly Mm -hmm. and the fly comes from the future and he's been sent back to the past to to say that okay you're the chosen hero to stop this um you know apocalyptic event and he's been sent back he's going to be tracked by someone else so but he's he just times of the essence but he's going to help you you know fulfill your destiny so as you go back you run into this um other monster known as starman jr which you might remember from um the smash brothers games one of the items so this this thing is much more powerful than you are at this point so buzz buzz has to has to save you he's able to use a shield ability so that you don't die instantly and he's the one doing all the damage to this thing not you um so you were able to beat it. You go on, and the very first thing that happens after that, because you were going out to rescue one of these children, you go to the parents of the kids who are these really stuck-up jerks who are very wealthy, and they're complaining about how, oh, they 
Uh, they they they're now in the pooler house because they had to they they loaned people money, but they're like in this lap of luxury mansion. So obviously they're it's BS. And um, they one of the the women there sees the fly and she slaps the fly. Buzz buzz. Oh no! <laughs> buzz buzz dies. He basically has this like hilarious death scene where it's drawn out where he like tells you his story. And he's like, oh, I guess I wasn't as as powerful as I thought I was. Like, the whole joke. And he gets to the very end and he goes, Oh, uh, I'm I'm about to go into the light. But do you want me to repeat my story? Real quick? <laughs> like yes, no. Just like uh, just ridiculous and like and, you, and I said no and then he goes oh good because I'm about to die and then like it's just absurd the way that it handles it um, little little jokes like that like the first town that you're in your home um, called Onet you know as, you, as, as I'm sure again people that have played Super Smash Brothers recognize it mm. well I didn't realize this until I found this, the second town but um, Onet is spelled you know one and then at the end the T's at the end it's, it's the first town oh. the second town is called Tucson. The third town is called uh, Freed. It's because it's a linear experience. It's right. a jo- it, it, it's a joke. Uh-huh. Um, like you 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 take your dog initially to go help you is before you find Buzz Buzz, and um, the dog helps you out um, as one of your party members. And then at a certain point, the dog, which you can apparently understand, the dog, no one else can. Uh, the dog just refuses to go. He's like, "No, nah, I'm done with adventure now. You just go on and do your own thing." <laughs> That's the way it was with Shaggy and Scoob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the game is is very is very self aware. Um, it has a lot of little, little touches, little silliness. Um, some of the some of the things, for example, like your psychic abilities are always silly. Um, like one of the ones that I have is just called uh, Psy Rock and Alpha. Is like one of my my like offensive attacks. Um, little things like a cameraman just shows up and has you like smile at the camera. They'll refer to the game like they'll talk. They'll say, "Oh yeah," when they give you tips. They'll refer to the the swirls on screen and the way that like the colors that show up to mm-hmm. say if you're being attacked from the front or back if you have an advantage. And they'll quickly correct themselves and say, "Oh no, I I, I mean that swirl around you, not the screen." Yeah, mm-hmm. it's little things like that. They'll talk about playing the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's an interesting experience that so far um, I will say that that there is some grinding involved that I've had to do. But the combat itself has been interesting enough that, that I'm able to continue. Um, I think that the appeal of this game is definitely the jokes, kind of the humor. Um, so I'll kind of have to see if, if if it will sustain in a full playthrough. Because I'm really not that far in the game. I've only completed the entire first section, like going through the giant step. And now mm-hmm. I'm in the second town. Um, which is probably about, you know, hour and a half, two hour experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll have to report back and let you know just how far I've gotten. I remember that style of game from that era mm-hmm. and that sort of quirky, almost meta acknowledgement um, in the humor. There were a lot of games that, that did that. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Metal Gear Survive. And uh, noticeably, there's a the, the V in Survive is stands out because it's emphasizing its uh, follow up to MGS5. Well, but it's not really the, the, the thing is when, when this was announced, and it's, it's had actually a lot of negative backlash mm-hmm. from Metal Gear fans, and it's not just because it's it is being made without Hideo Kojima. Right. It's not just that. It's right. because it's a completely different sort of game. Mm-hmm. And they're just basically trying to bank on the Metal Gear name. They just say, okay. Uh, yeah, it's like I was trying to figure out like how seriously they were or weren't taking it. And when I heard the trailer described to me, yeah. I, I figured, okay, surely they're not taking it seriously. And I watched it and it seemed like, well, the way they're presenting it is like, you know, pretty, it seems fairly serious. But like the, the whole premise is that, uh, so at the end of Ground Zeroes, uh, when uh, Mother Base gets attacked, the guys who get left behind on the, uh, on the rig uh, get sucked up into this interdimensional vortex mm-hmm. and dropped into this barren planet in which they crystal-headed zombies. Yeah, zombie zombie apocalypse is going on. Apparently. Yeah, basically. And so my understanding is it's kind of like there's probably going to be some base building element. I guess it's supposed to be cooperative. And no, it is cooperative. It's yeah. uh, you're fighting off zombies and trying to get back home. And so they're calling it Metal Gear Survive. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's a different. So it, I don't understand the Metal Gear aside from just throwing in some sort of weird world connection. And it's running the Fox engine, so I mean, yeah, but... Yeah, but for me... So, so is, like, the, the PES soccer. Yeah. So, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, no, it, it does basically seem like a cash-in on the Metal Gear franchise. It's like, hey, we have the IP, let's make something with it. It, it feels like, um, a, like sort of a Left for Dead kind of rip ball. Yeah, I will say that like, because I, I knew it was, it was inevitable that Konami keeping the rights, they were going to make another Metal Gear game that wasn't going to have Gojima. And I know one of the big complaints is, for example, that um, 
it's going away from the series roots because it doesn't seem to have an emphasis on stealth anymore. So like it, it, the, the trailer at least is definitely, it's an action game. Um, for me though, if they are going to do something, at least I can go into it now knowing that it's not meant to be another Metal Gear Solid. It is something else in the same universe? Question mark. I mean, it's like now, now it's, it's not even in the same universe. Now, now it's, it's yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> literally, it's literally taking place in another yeah. universe. Um, but it's it, it's not like they're trying to break the hearts of Metal Gear fans by like making a game that's trying to be Kojima without Kojima. And so, in that regard, it's like if they're <laughs> going to do anything with the franchise, I'm glad it's something that's so well, clearly ridiculous and not. It, you realize that yes. also after Kojima, they also did something else with the franchise that we've talked about before. Yeah, we have, yeah. Metal Gear Solid 3 Pachinko. Yeah, yeah. So, you I mean, mean the, the erotic Pachinko? The erotic, Metal Gear Solid 3 erotic Pachinko. So, I mean, they, they, they really... Konami, to me, is, is pretty much a dead company at this point. Um, You're dead to me. Yeah, pretty much. Is, does that explain the zombie fixation? Maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Metaphorically. Everything, everything makes sense. Because it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those situations that I, I really... I cannot ever see myself getting Metal Gear Survive for starters. It, it doesn't. It doesn't look like it appeals to me. Um, but also, I just find what they're doing, kind of the concept behind it, is just kind of insulting to fans of the series. I, I don't really feel that it has anything to do with Metal Gear at all. To kind of say, um, oh yeah, so like uh, there, when all these soldiers got blown up, which is one of the one of the you know driving forces behind Snake it's taking, in, you're in taking the game. Revenge, yeah. yeah, you're saying, okay, you know what? They didn't actually die. They got sucked into another dimension with for, like, zombies. For reasons? It sounds like fan fiction. It, sound, it sounds like, <laughs> no, it, like it, horrible it, fan fiction. It seriously does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there a practical reason for it? Like, for example, they, they're going, you know what? We've got this idea for a game, uh, but de- deving it would actually just take too much time. Let's grab the assets from something we already have. Well, pff, let me tell you what game we've got that's got tons of assets, and we overpaid for because the de- de- you know the designer couldn't uh, couldn't put a lid on this stupid thing. Maybe we can actually make some more money off of this project that went long. We fired the guy. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. From from the company's perspective, maybe it's looking uh, like an opportunity to maybe regain some lost capital mm-hmm. on assets there. They, they have they have an engine. You know, I'm sure it's going to yeah. be running basically the same engine as MGS Five. Yeah, exactly. And not just the Fox engine. I mean, like the game play engine too yeah so that's that's my positive spin on it It, maybe it's not just a cash grab um but but an attempt to recoup some losses and again like i i don't know i'm definitely not gonna pay full price for it and actually it to me it might it almost has a bit of the vibe of like you know as if it was uh, left for dead you know maybe it's going to be a a free to play where you just download it for free play it maybe you know pay for some dlc or something like that which i think would be an interesting move i think that that'd be kind of smart um if it is something they expect you to pay 60 bucks for um then you know i might grab it a year later when it's five bucks in the bargain bin you know yeah to give it a shot but yeah at least it's not like i'd feel more insulted if it was hey it's mgs6 uh, or it's MGS five two or whatever, um, and we're trying to very clearly take it seriously and have it be a follow up and just it not be good enough. Well, you know? you know, zombie DLC is kind of an old tradition. It, there, there's lots of shooters that had zombie versions and survive versions. Even, um, I mean, le, uh, what, what was the what was the a Red Dead Redemption? You yeah, know, it, it even had it's, it's which I. I and about that, I actually bought that, and I, maybe I should go back and try it to play it again, but I bought it because I'm a huge Red Dead Redemption fan. It's one of my favorite games of all time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got the zombie DLC, played through the first maybe 45 minutes of it, put it away. Never to touch it again? Yeah, and so maybe I should go back and try it again, but it just it wasn't very well done. Well, I just think... <laughs> yeah, but you're right, it is a, it is a trope. It's, 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 it's been done to death with all the zombie stuff, and at this point... Done to undeath. Yeah, yeah, part of it is... Uh, <laughs> it just I, won't die. The, the trope that won't die. die. <laughs> I, I can't stand because zombies. The, the undead don't die. It's so ridiculous. I can't stand zombies. I mean, it's like, you, they're everywhere. It's ridiculous. I'm yeah. sick of them. Um, so before we move on, I just did want to mention this, and, and I'm sure it's actually much worse now. When the original trailer was put up, IGN put it up from Gamescom after this game, this or sorry, Gamescom mm-hmm. um, after Metal Gear Survive was announced. Um, within the first hour, it had you know almost 300k views, um, 25,000 uh, thumbs down, no. <laughs> 25,000, only 3,000 thumbs up. Ooh. So very, very, and that that was within like an hour. It got much worse. Mm-hmm. They actually took the took it 
took it down and then put it back up to try to avoid some of the negative. Yeah, Clear, and, and clearly apparently the publishers at least liked. Yeah, and apparently the publishers are coming out and saying like, you know, hey, keep an open mind. You know, like we're going with a new yes. direction. I'm yes. actually I'm not inherently opposed to them taking a new direction. Like I've said, like you know, Metal Gear Rising I enjoyed as kind of like an interesting spin off of here's this franchise and here's some cool ideas from it, and we're going to take it in a different direction. So it's not like I'm inherently opposed to them taking Metal Gear and doing something different with it. It's just... Well, they've done things different with it yeah, before. It and just, sometimes this, it works. Like Metal looks, Gear Rising or, or Metal Gear Acid, if yeah. you haven't played those. Metal Gear Acid. Yeah, yeah. Were no, those games. were cool. And those were very clearly non-canon. Yes. and and But this one is... The concept is stupid. I think it's a big thing, and why people are turning against yeah, it. I'm kind of concerned that they are calling it canon because they say it takes place after the events. Like, if they if they're sort of saying, okay, so here's here's the setup, and here's kind of uh, like the what if scenario of what if they got sucked into a vortex and had to fight zombies to get back home. That would be just as dumb. It'd be just as dumb, but at least it's not canon. Well, I don't. Even, I don't <laughs> no one's going to count this as canon anyway. It yeah, doesn't make true, any sense. True. I mean, according to this, I mean, like you said. Um, Konami's come out and is trying to play damage control on it. Mm. Like, apparently a quote, there's stealth, it'll be good, we promise. I don't know if that's a direct quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you have to say I, that I feel, I, feel like, I feel like that's a paraphrase. <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, he's other, he, it's not. Oh. It says, uh, there will be stealth, and one of, one of the really interesting things that we will be exploring and playing with is how stealth and co-op can actually coexist. Wait, they've already done that. <laughs> like they did that in Peace Walker, so they don't know what this guy doesn't even know what he's talking. He doesn't even know his own series. Not, not to mention idiot. Metal Gear Online. Yeah, idiot, <laughs> idiot. Okay, so um, what I'm getting at is, don't play, don't get Metal Gear Survive. It's trash. Go play one of the older Metal Gear games. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now this week's meaty topic of discussion. Just to kind of reintroduce the the, uh, the concept again, um, we're talking about um, attributes. Mm-hmm. Attributes, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, um, a film should have in order to evoke the feeling of a video game. And some of the the films that I felt, um, you know, really to me felt like video games in different ways. Um, the Last Starfighter, Tron. Scott Pilgrim versus the World, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and these are game, these are films that to me they, they in different ways they had feelings of, of a video game. For example, with Scott Pilgrim, um, each of the different boyfriends felt like they were they were you know mini bosses yeah, along yeah. the way, and mm-hmm. it was sort of structured almost like um, you know a a beat 'em up type game. Mm-hmm. I mean, we look at something like Last Starfighter. On the other hand, um, it. The whole game was sent. I don't know if you all have seen the film. I, oh, I yeah. actually recommend it, but I've seen it four or five times. Yeah, it's, actually, it's actually really good. It, um, I'm not supposed to like it. I'm a Gen Xer and, <laughs> and, and supposed to hate that film. Really? I actually Why love it. I, 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 I never heard of that. Fantastic. Why are we supposed to hate it? Yeah, because it's a it's a millennial thing. It's it's a millennial driven film. It came out in the '80s. What did Last Starfighter? Oh, I thought you were talking about uh, Scott Pilgrim. No. No, I, I, I went over <laughs> yeah, Last you, Starfighter. I you, finished you missed Scott the transition. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, oh. Well, I, I totally missed the transition, oh. but yeah, I've seen, I've seen both of them. Yeah, so uh, Last Starfighter is, is uh, you know, a film about, which just basically was made to be a um, every kid's dream kind of film, where oh, it's yeah. like, oh, um, you're not just the kid in the, like, you know, the, well, he wasn't that young, but kid, essentially, mm-hmm. in a town that's created an arcade game. No, you're the best in the universe, and you've been chosen to be an actual Starfighter because you're so great at this game that you're now going to be playing the game for real. Mm-hmm. That's how the army does it now. Um, yeah. you know, they, but they, they just troll the arcades and then they, they pick right. out people for their drone pilots. But the way that they portrayed the, the, no. um, <laughs> yes, the, the battle, the battles between the, the, the enemies in last Starfighter felt very much like, um, a shoot 'em up type game. I mean, sure, it felt yeah. very much like that kind of experience. And then Tron, of course, went for this and it's an even older movie. Um, but it went for these, you know, older style experiences of like, um, almost like imagining the future of video games, like mm-hmm. the VR space of games and what that might entail and putting characters into this VR world and how, how would games work in this space? And so it almost had its own rules for games and it had, a, it took its own approach to, to gaming in the sense of, Hey, what if games were like this? Here's how people would, would play them. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, to me, I don't know if y'all have any other examples that you feel. I sort throw of... Run Lola Run into that mix. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I, I think that for different reasons yeah. that we can talk about, that one's a, a good one. But whenever I used to teach nonlinearity, mm-hmm. um, the one of the six types of nonlinearity, as we've talked about in the past on the show here, uh, is the branching type. 
And I think that that one is a great example of branching because if you haven't seen the film, basically Lola needs to get money for her boyfriend, who's a crook, really fast. Mm -hmm. And she considers, and and some say she's fantasizing about it, others saying that that she's actually living it, and then when we're seeing all the different things that she's chosen. uh, But basically it's it's choice. It represents choice. If I do A, if I do B, if I do C, if I do D, different things will happen, Mm -hmm. and only one of, of, of them is successful, basically. Um, I, I might actually throw out um, Sliding Doors as another example, which shows two parallel possibilities, but that's more of a mechanical sense. I'm not sure that that really feels like a video game movie. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that's more of a mechanical thing. Uh, but what what, what I, was the one thing you told us that had, it was like the, um, like however many minutes or something like that, and it was like four different parallel stories happening at the same time. You saw all four screens at the same time. Oh. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I would have to check my notes on that one. But I forget the name of it, but like that one I'd almost say is kind of, in a sense, an ergodic one. Yeah. In a sense, you can explore any of the perspectives at your own pace. Well, there have been a couple of them. They're all kind of terrible. But mm. um, basically what it does is it divides the screen into four mm. um, ca- you mm. know, corners, if mm-hmm. you will. And then we actually see, filmed in real time, the the different four different perspectives of the same thing. And they all merge and characters cross from one over into another, that sort of thing. How, how they hid the cameras, I think, is the most impressive thing about that sort of thing. Or that they did it all in one take, like a play. But um, regardless, I, I think that what, what you identified, Jim, in your examples are games that have... Um, or films. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Fil- films that have games in them. Um, as well. Uh, for example, Tron. Literally, yeah. he gets into the light car mm-hmm. and he has to play and he has to do a contest. Mm-hmm. In that sense, I might say that if, if we're looking at films that have contests embedded within them or some kind of a thing, uh, some of the Harry Potters would, would fit. Specifically, Goblet of Fire felt very video gamey to me um, because the whole thing is about the Triwizard Tournament mm. and there's, you know, three or four different tasks that he has to perform. And that, that felt very video gamey in that sense so, to me. And, and I'm not, I'm not really a Harry Potter fan. So I'm, I'm not as familiar with some of the, right, sure. the references, but I, but I get what you're saying. And I think, um, do you think that it's something where if you, if you have like a contest or a tournament, it automatically feels more structured like a game, not or necessarily. At least structured like some games. Um, like an example of that would be say uh bloodsport, an old, an old film that yeah. was about, you know, the Kumite and you fighting Death the Race. They recently redid like a mm-hmm. sequel to Death Race. Well, see, I would say Death Race to me definitely is like a video game. Yeah, I the agree. Death Race two thousand, and I haven't seen the the remake, but I saw the original. I don't know if it's a sequel or a remake. I think it's kind of both. Mm-hmm. I think they did a remake and then they did a sequel to the remake, yeah. as, as I understand. But the 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 way that it was structured, and maybe it's it's also. Um, it it very much has this feel of some of the old style arcade games where. Yeah. Death is just part of it, the experience. Like, that's it's right. not treated in a serious way, that's I guess. Right. I don't know yeah. how oh, to... I just killed that guy. Yeah. Right. And so that, and that's the way that you feel in some of those old arcade mm-hmm. games. Like, say you're playing, like, Spy Hunter, mm-hmm. for example. It's one of, the, one of the games I would compare Death Race to. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're, you know, in this car that can shoot guns, essentially, and you're going around this track, and you're trying to stop people from shooting at you, and you're supposed to be taking out other vehicles. But there's also vehicles there that are, you know, non... They're just like random vehicles that are not actually out to kill you. But if you shoot them, who cares? Mm-hmm. It's like everything is just like, oh, well, I'm going to go around and I'm in this death car and I'm just going to, things are going to happen. Yeah. So I think that, like, you know, based on all the examples we've given so far, I have kind of like my theory on what it is that makes okay. these movies feel like games. And I'll give another kind of a broad example, not a specific one. Um, a lot of the movies to, to me, uh, that to me feel like games are kung fu films. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I was going to mention some of those oh, too. Yeah. yeah. Like Crouching Tiger um, mm-hmm. almost, I, I almost say, levels up through um, the film. Um, Hero I would, is I would one, say, I think. Yeah, it, yeah. I would say Hero, yes. I would argue Crouching Tiger does not. I, no? I like the movie, but I just think that structure is much more dramatic. Matt, almost opera, opera. Um, well, right. that's true. What, that's what was point. the one? Riccio um, is the one I would say. If you ever saw Riccio, I don't know if I've seen Riccio. I'm thinking of. Um, it was, I think, Indonesian. Um, there's this cop that goes in uh, the oh, raid. The raid, yeah, and yes. the, the raid too. Especially the raid too, especially was very much structured mm-hmm. like because it, it, it had 
little boss. Like you would, yeah. it's like he would go through parts of it, take out henchmen, mm-hmm. and then fight a boss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the bosses all had their own like weird themes mm-hmm. to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that I think that's getting to what I was going to say that is that a few elements. One, a highly competent protagonist. Mm-hmm. Um, even if they start off relatively weak compared to what they will become, um, they are competent enough to be able to overcome challenges and to learn. And by the end of it, they're going to be able to take on the big boss. Mm-hmm. That's the other element, the big boss at the end and or the the sort of like mini bosses in between, Um, or at the very least kind of obstacles. So here is a challenge, here's a challenge, here's a challenge. I think anything that's kind of in the adventure or the action adventure genre Mm -hmm. um, could sort of have elements like this um, because it's all about here is my my quest, my mission for the film, and I'm trying to do A, B, and C to accomplish it. Sucker punch. Oh, yeah, Sucker Punch. Sucker Punch. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. The thing about Sucker Punch is um, there's a reality that has a, a fantasy embedded within it. And mm-hmm. then within that fantasy, there are smaller fantasies, which are almost like musical numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, they're dances within the, the narrative. But, but really what they are is action adventure sequences mm-hmm. um, scripted almost entirely like a level of a video um, game. Inception. Oh, great example. Because that one's kind of got, like, we have to do A, B, and C in order to accomplish our mission. Yeah. Um, any heist, I guess you could argue. Uh, does heist that movies? Any, any heist yeah, caper movie. I could see that. Um, I think anything that has just these elements of, here are the obstacles that are set before us, and here's our goal, and we're going to, with our very, like, highly skilled competencies, um, work our way through these until we accomplish our goal. I can see that. And I think also... Um, and that, that, le- that element of kind of, like growing tension and elevation and escalation mm-hmm. until you get to like the, the big climax. And usually that tends to happen from what I've seen very near the end. There's not much yeah. of a, a, a falling action in denouement, much like games. Very often you have the, the big final climax, the big final boss fight, and then cut that's not kind of an American thing though. Yeah. I mean, if you look into classical literature, that's uh, a lot more balanced actually, even as far or as more as recent as Shakespeare, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, now a lot of what we've talked about has been, been narrative here. I mean, we could even right. say that Lord of the Rings, uh, the film adaptations feel a little bit more like video games than the original texts and so much that's left mm-hmm. out of the texts drives it towards yeah. feeling like a video game. I would say the Hobbit series even more. Yes, I agree. Series. Particularly, I mean, the first one especially, I felt that that whole... Um, the whole se- segment inside the Goblin Kingdom. Yeah, I agree. Very much had like a video gamey feel to it. It really did. We've got to escape that. Kind of but there's an irony there because um, if if that's really being influenced by games, it's being influenced by role playing games specifically, mm-hmm. which were derived out of tabletop role playing right. games, which were specifically created so that uh, players could live and and play in the Lord of the Rings universe. It, it's so mm-hmm. ironic. And I, I think what we're getting at too, and this is something that you know I've noticed, and one of the th- one of the reasons why I don't read as many modern books. I read a lot of older books. Mm-hmm. And part of that is, um, at a certain point, once film and television as well um, got more mainstream, became more mainstream, the way that books were written changed. Like, the way that the way that um, descriptions were, were written in books became much more almost exclusively visual to the sense that people are writing... Many authors, I've noticed, are writing it, it, it as though this is what you would see if this was a film. What decade would you point to for that? That, that started because mm-hmm. um, I agree with you heavily. I I, 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 I think I can point to a very specific uh, author, like seventies or eighties, I guess. Yeah, um, I, around what I would say because I usually go before that. I would I would look at Terry Brooks as being one of the ones who changed it. Hmm. Uh, I really would. I think that the Shannara. See, when we talked about Shannara yeah. the other day. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the Shannara series of books when. Um, I recently got the annotated version of Sword of Sonara, which is funny because I had just finished reading it. I wanted to read the annotated version. And it's really neat because it's very meta. He talks about his process um, of writing, and, and the intro is very, very clear on this. And he talks about how he had to give up TV, he had to give up women, and he had to give up drinking, only not in that order, uh, <laughs> and, and, and just lock himself away. And then it basically took seven years for him to write the first draft of the first trilogy. And so... Uh, you know, whenever you look at it in that context of someone who's media saturated, which he obviously was, at what point, you know, is that is that coming through? Because he says his influences were um, uh, specifically Tolkien, Lord mm-hmm. of the Rings, uh, and also um, more more of the suspense type novels. Well, to me, it's something that I've noticed, um, and why I read a lot of older stuff as well is. Um, they're written in such a way that they're trying to put you in that place. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of newer books feel like they're written in such a way that they want you to 
be watching the action. Yes. Like, it feels very, very focused on the visual yes. of like, and, and audio to an extent, but it's like, what would it be like if this were a movie? Whereas the other was more trying to in, in, evoke all of the senses, trying mm-hmm. to get you to really feel like you're in this place and you're, you know, what, trying to describe it as an actual place as opposed to something that you would see. Yes. And, and I, I do think that that's because of, of the great influence that film and television has had. But I also think that because of video games and why we started seeing these these sort of, all, all the films and, and, and things that we're talking about all came, came about, um after the advent of gaming started to become bigger in like the, mm-hmm. you know, the later seventies um, and then into the eighties and, and as we've gone on. So I think that's why we're, we're seeing more and more films that have influences from games. Obviously there's yeah. been, there's been back and forth. Of course, films have been, uh, have influenced games as well. But um, I think, you know, as games become bigger and bigger, we're seeing more and more influences, especially when we're talking about the big Hollywood blockbuster mm-hmm. um, and sort of the formulas that they're following are, are similar to the sort of the, the style of um, video game, particularly when, when I'm talking about video games, we're talking about those games like like Chris is talking about the highly competent protagonist mm-hmm. and you know the, these obstacles, whether they're, whether they're actual characters like big mini boss, big boss, or, or they're challenge mini mini come. challenge, big challenge kind mm-hmm. of thing. You get through the There's maze, the build up. You know? Like you start out with smaller challenges, then you go up and and um, I I do think there is some influence there in terms of of gaming aesthetics. That and just that that feeling of these are, I mean, especially, especially it happens in, in, in action games, and there's probably some back and forth between action games and action films as mm-hmm. well. But that feeling of, oh, these are the henchmen, mm-hmm. they don't matter, kind of, right. kind of feel. Mm-hmm. And that's very much big in video games as well. There's also, I think, an element in a lot of these of set pieces, where there, yeah. there tends to be a variety of different environments in which you're going to have things happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and each set piece kind of has its own sort of theme or this new challenge that's imposing. So, you know, a kung fu film, especially, say, like, you know, Jackie Chan films, mm-hmm. um, you're going to have, it's not just another fight, it's a fight on top of a train. It's a fight in this forge. Yeah. And the environment's going to play a lot into um, the action that's playing out, and there, there are new challenges. It's like different stages. Yeah, exactly. Where, where you're, you're, you where don't want to, you can't just fight in the same stage all the time because it gets boring. So you have another to reason, stage every another time. reason I think of Inception is because it's like, okay, here's the, here's the ice level. Yeah. Here's the, you yeah. know, that, that on and on and on. So, um, yeah. Some of the more recent James Bond movies have felt more like video games than the early ones too. Oh yeah, no, definitely. So I think that there's been some, some influence in that kind of a thing how how all of our action movies progress mm-hmm. it's almost like that instead of giving you know giving the viewers the uh 10 pieces of the puzzle that I have to put together in order to to put the puzzle together it's all in sequence you know it's like here's the first piece here's the second piece here's the mm-hmm. second piece and, and 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 so it's a lot easier to put to solve the mystery at the end of the film you know who the bad guy is. You know why you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Instead of it being a, a convoluted double twist with mm-hmm. this really neat thing, and oh, she was the femme fatale the whole time, and it turns out that there was a betrayal. You know what I mean? I, I, I think stuff. I, I just don't see that much. Some, something that ties in, I think, to what I was saying earlier about um, having the quest on which you embark um, is a gaming concept of putting the door before the key. Yes. We know from the yeah. outset what it is we're trying to do and what we need to try to overcome, and then what we're watching is the process of overcoming it. That's, that's a good right. point. Yeah. yeah, and that's something that you don't necessarily need to do in a film. But you're right; it, it just it feels like we're doing that more and more. And the more doors you have, um, you know, whenever I, I used to do um, alternate reality games, mm. uh, I sat in 2007. Uh, at Arg Festocon and listened to 42 Entertainment talking about the Beast and how um, they had done I Love Bees and various other things um, and their design philosophy and they described it as being a series of doors on a hallway um, but there's a very big difference between a hallway that has doors on your right and doors on your left as you go down the hallway than doors that are in sequence so you walk up to a door you have to get through this door and when you're behind the, uh, that door oh look we continue down the hallway and there's one there's another door and it's and it's segmenting off the hallway so yeah. you see there's a big difference you can talk about a door a metaphor of door doors on a hallway but whenever you don't clarify whether those doors are on the side or in front, it, it changes the entire metaphor. And so this whole idea of uh, where are the doors and the keys um, is, I think, one of the things that's going to be an identifier for video game movies if, in, in the way we're talking about them. 
Meaning that you have a challenge before you that you have to accomplish before you move on to the next one. I think it's always going to be segments, door, hallway, door, hallway, door, hallway. And I think to kind of distinguish this that we're talking about from, you know, because we're not talking about adaptation, we're talking about the feel of video games and films. But I think a lot of the reasons that sometimes these films based on video games don't feel like the games is because there's a focus on the narrative of the game mm-hmm. and yeah. they're not trying to create the feel of the game. They're, they're, the, the ones, the video game films, that are trying to take themselves seriously that would say like hey the objective in this film is to go and you know fight the seven bosses in order to collect all the keys in order to unlock the final door and uh-huh. save the world they don't say that because it would feel cheesy yeah it would feel too much like a game um it's the ones that are able to kind of like and you know scott pilgrim of course is based on the comic book which was inspired heavily by video games and you right. have to defeat the 11 ex-boyfriends in order to win her heart mm-hmm. um but that's, you know, like, they, they were very, they, they were aware of that, you know, and the, the thing is kind of tongue-in-cheek, and it's, you know, it, it knows what it's doing, mm-hmm. so that's, it's able to get away with it, but anything else has to be a little bit more subtle with its, uh, you know, the defeat the four henchmen so you can fight the final boss sort of thing. And that's the, but like you, I mean, like you said, it does come up a lot in, in action movies, especially mm-hmm. um, foreign action films. That, that is kind of something that is a running theme with these mini bosses like henchmen mini bosses Mm -hmm. and then the big boss yeah so do you think then that the influence that that has had let's let's just talk about japanese film for example or Mm -hmm. or anime uh the the influence that that's had on video games within that genre has been then circular or do you think it's the other way around no i think it's circular i think i think that that um you know, Asian, particularly, you know, Japan, because they, they had so, came up with so many different, you know, game concepts mm-hmm. and introduced the West to a lot of game concepts. Um, they took inspiration from their media and the media that they were familiar with. Yeah. Not just Japanese media, but uh, media, you know, Asian media as well, but also Hollywood films too. Right. And and they, in, they instilled in games some of those um, concepts. And then later, um, you know, games went their own way, you know, took some of those concepts, but also had to develop them in order to work in a game space. And then later, um, as games became such a big part of culture um, over there and over here too, but especially over in over in Japan, um, there was an influence that kind of went back and forth into films. So because games, Japanese games, even though they might be, you know, from Japan, have also had a very strong influence on media in America too. Mm-hmm. So I, I would say that there's kind of a circular relationship there. Uh, I think I think that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I hadn't even thought about it in the connection that, that you were you were saying of um, cause Mario. I mean, Mario is out of Japan. You know, yeah. We, oh, yeah. we think of it as an Italian plumber, but 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 honestly, you know, he, he, he come, it comes straight out of Japan. Mm-hmm. The idea of of having levels and worlds and that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Where did that come from? I mean, it, it came from video games. Where did that? Where does so, it fundamentally come from? In deposit, set, I guess. Set pieces in, in films, right? I mean, ah. generally, the concept of, like, you have different, different, you know, sets, different areas in films where, where action happens. Maybe so. I, I, I think mean, all, of, be all of that, to me, so, comes yes. from um, myth. It comes from the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that what all these kind of have in common, like, it's kind of like the relationship between squares and rectangles. You know, mm-hmm. not all are not all rectangles are squares, but not, but all squares are rectangles. Right, sure. I think pretty much all these that we've been talking about so far are hero's journeys. But not all hero's journeys are necessarily going to feel like video games. Um, but what we have is, um, you know, you start off in one world, and then there's the other world that you have to go through in order to achieve the boon. And sometimes it just ends with getting the boon, but then there's also the return with the boon mm-hmm. as part of this whole, you know, Campbellian hero's journey cycle monomyth. Um, and I think that what a lot of these have in common is the fact that there's there's always at least two worlds. There's the world in which you start and you call home, and then there's the other world in which you enter. Right. Um, and a lot of times in these these some of these myths, you have like crossing like multiple different regions. Like you have to go through the desert and through the forest and up the mountain or whatever the case might be. Um, and I think that that sort of idea of journeying and seeing the the scenery change seeing location change indicates movement and so i think that it's something that people can relate to very easily when they see a change in scenery there's a sense of progress that's a good point and i think that that's part of the reason that we have it in games and why that sort of is translated back into film i really enjoy cal bashir's work on that by the way might might want to hit his website um cal bashir but um what what i think hit me right out of the gate today when we started talking about this um was was not just the idea of the narrative, um, but also the mechanic 
mm. uh, mechanical similarities. So I, I, I'm going to stand on record here and say that I think that the games that are identifiable as having um, game-like elements or feeling like games without being a direct adaptation are going to be the ones that are going to have a recognizable quest narrative mm-hmm. and also be broken up in such a way as to have clear divisions within the film itself Mm -hmm. so that there are what we would kind of call mini bosses they may be Mm -hmm. challenges but smaller challenges then that lead to the ultimate challenge at the end i think that that's an identifiable pattern running man is a great example oh yeah oh definitely running man's great i mean it's um not just as a great example i love the movie i mean it's it's one of my i guess you could call it a guilty pleasure but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not really even guilty about it it's, i love it yeah i mean you want uh, to talk about mini bosses i mean oh yeah just consistently and each one had their own theme mm-hmm. they, had, they had a couple of things and i think this is also part of it too in video games especially in, in older video games um newer ones try to do this as well but they just do it a little differently but you had you wanted your bosses to stand out from the henchmen you wanted, sure. you wanted very, visual to be visually recognizable as oh these are different these are special and so in Running Man, you, you have that. Each of the, each of the um, what were they called? Not, they were called assassins. They had some, some cool... Gladiators name. or something. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. But they had some special name, and I, I can't remember. But um, I think i got to watch it. Oh, i got to watch it again. I was going to uh, say, you call yourself a fan? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so, so each one had their own little theme, and like they would kill you in a different way. And, and you, you knew exactly when he was up against one of these other bosses because um, they were presented in a different way. And then, of course... Um, like some video games do, okay, there's there's the final battle that he has, but of course there is that extra twist that they have where he doesn't really have the final battle and it was all fake and they do the, they right, kind sure, of the yeah. fake out at the end, um, which was which was kind of interesting. But but then it's just phase two of the boss. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, um, well, yeah. If he I, falls I think, out of his helicopter. You got to beat him. I, I think that's a good that's a good example. I think actually a lot of '80s action movies in particular. Um, I feel. Um, there was that circular relationship but with between video games and 80s action movies where 80s action movies influenced a lot of our gaming mm-hmm. but also games influenced a lot of the, the the style and the setup of 80s of 80s action movies the tone and yeah, yes absolutely um, when we're talking about you know 80s films like um, pretty much all of Arnold Schwarzenegger's catalog yeah. predator <laughs> commando um, and running man like we talked about um, but then also some a lot of Stallone's movies, not the first Rambo, not First Blood, mm-hmm. of course, but the sequels very much so. Oh, that's very true. They're, the sequels very much so. In fact, um, um, Rambo, Rambo, two, uh, what was it? It was called First Blood Part Two, Rambo, yeah, 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 whatever yeah. it was. That one very much felt like um, had a video game aesthetic, and sort of the sort of the third one uh, where he's helping out like uh, the Taliban or whatever, <laughs> whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, I think it was actually literally him <laughs> helping the Taliban because that was they were the good guys. That was the political climate at the time. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, the, the, um, the Russians are always the bad guys, right? <laughs> always. Mm-hmm. Or, um, but yeah, like that very much has that, and, and I think there's that sense of too in video games where you have the the leveling up. Mm-hmm. Um, some of these films do take that into account. Scott Pilgrim mm-hmm. does, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah he literally levels yeah. up and he has a second life. Yeah. That mm-hmm. kind of goes back in time. And, and last, last Starfighter does, does something similar as well with him, um, you know, improving and getting better. And there's this sense of him. Um, it's part of it is tied to confidence, but mm-hmm. there's definitely a, a feeling of him, leveling up mm. when he needs to and, and getting any, better before he gets to the you know boss fights and and anything that. with the training montage um <laughs> uh kung fu films where they have to like go and learn the secret technique in order to be able to beat the person they can't and beat that was the other one too yeah, and I, I think, side mission yeah and i think uh, special abilities because there are actually there are films that have that have tied in special abilities mm. and those become so big in video games and but that that ties in pretty directly with something i was going to mention yeah which, we, we talked about the highly competent protagonist, and mm-hmm. one of the ways that you highlight the, the competency of someone is by getting granular and detailed with the action. Yeah. Um, whatever the action happens to be, it could just be like, this person's really good at, you know, political maneuvering, for example, uh, or, you know, persuading someone through conversation. Right. But what's his but, special move? Yeah, well, that's the, exactly. That's, but that, that, that's my right? point, is, yeah. is that, you know, one, we, we show you that they're competent by having them... Like the, there's very tangible, like here's this problem and here's how they solve it. Mm-hmm. Despite all these things, it might have said that it couldn't be solved. And then sometimes it is the special move, like you know Sherlock has you know the the mind palace that lets him go back and recall something that no one else remembers, and that's the thing that yeah. kind of like clicks. That's and a good one. so he's got you know he, his specialty is being Sherlock, you know. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that I think that's an element of that. Right. I mean, like Last Starfighter that I mentioned a lot, he has he has the Death Blossom, which mm-hmm. is like a special ability that a ship can do that he learns, and that's 
that's like straight out of the arcade experience where you have that one special move that you can pull off, but it's gonna it's gonna burn your special meter, but you can use it in like dire dire circumstances. Mm-hmm. You know, it feels very much like a video game. Mm-hmm. Um, or a lot of kung fu films where have like they have like a special move. Kung Fu Hustle, um, one of my all time favorite films. Very much is structured like a video game, mm-hmm. um, and again, it's because of that relationship that I think from Asian action films have have influenced games, and games have influenced Asian action mm-hmm. films, and there's mm-hmm. been this particular relationship. But Kung Fu Hustle has that where he has these he, he specifically learns a special ability. He mm-hmm. learns the you know Buddhist palm mm-hmm. technique, and it is very much okay. He just has to find the right combination in order to use it. Of course, mm-hmm. there's also that sense of him leveling up, which mm-hmm. is a big part of the film too. Um, him getting better and better and not even realizing that he is for a while um, until he has that like enlightened moment at the end where he has to battle a bunch of henchmen before the final boss. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think we've kind of hit on a lot, of, a lot of the points here. And I think, I think one thing that sort of the takeaway is because there are, there are a lot of ga- um, video game adaptations and there's going to be more of them. Yeah. And there have I been think, very few good ones. Exactly, but I think one of the one of the reasons for that, and this is maybe a, a direction they should try to go, is, is instead of trying to take a video game and boil it down only to its story, and then try to adapt the story to a film, mm-hmm. maybe instead they should look at okay, what makes what is what interests people about this game, and mm-hmm. can we adapt, you know, that feeling, yeah. that tone into film. Yeah, I said about the Mad Max game that I would love to uh, them to take each element once and then turn that into a film. I, mm-hmm. th- I thought it would be very good. There's a very specific story they're telling at the beginning mm-hmm. and at the end, um, at the ending. But um, uh, I Fury can... Road, I think, actually, as I say that, comes to mind as another what this sounds exactly, or feels exactly like a video game. Oh, yeah. To, to put it maybe a weird way, I think that a lot of times when we get video game adaptations of a particular thing, again, it's focusing on the story or maybe it's part of the idea or the world. Um, but we don't really have the film that is essentially just kind of like a quick walkthrough of the game in a sense. Right. It's not like retelling, like here, here's kind of what a perfect run of the game looks like, mm-hmm. you know, obviously with some adaptations cause it's film and not a game. Yeah. yeah except, but, except for super Mario brothers, the, the feature film from the nineties. I mean, that one was just yeah, that's, perfect. That was it. That was... <laughs> um, but you know, the, this idea that, you know, say, like, Prince of Persia, like, take one of the Prince of Persia games, here's the storyline, and here's, like, all the obstacles you had to overcome, yeah. or maybe you, you pick out some of the coolest moments, and you basically just show cinematically it happening in a way that's, like, this new angle on it, because we couldn't, you know, we had to be controlling the characters, so we yeah. were stuck with the HUD and, you know, behind the shoulder, but, like, hey, here's what this looks like, and maybe we have some more flair, but, you know, you have the same sorts of action that's in the games, and not just kind of, like ignore what made, as you said, Jim, what made the game appealing to players um, in favor of just focusing on the characters of the story. One of the problems with that, though, is that it takes a good 12 to 18 hours to play that game through. Mm-hmm. And so... Oh, yeah. Like, you want to do the You'd have to day, condense naturally. it down, obviously. Uh, but I, I'm reminded of the Doom movie. You remember that? Oh, yeah. And obviously that is an adaptation. But it is. What's interesting about it is it actually does feel a lot like a video game. Now, it was a terrible movie for other reasons, <laughs> but there was a sequence in it. I believe it was about a 12-minute sequence mm-hmm. in it. Felt like it was about an hour and a half. That was literally done in first person mm-hmm. where, who was it, The Rock or somebody? Yeah, The Rock was the, the main guy. Yeah, the where, main where, he's, where you get the whole, the, literally they pulled in the sound effects from the video game, the ha, ha, ha. Uh, right, and he's going, and you see his, you see his arms, you see his gun, you see him punching aliens. I mean, it, or, or demons. It was so bad and so stupid. But there was just this moment where you're just like, nailed it. Yeah, <laughs> and they didn't. But you, you, you want them to have yeah. Sil- you know? Silent Hill. I believe it was Silent Hill. The film. Oh yeah, they made the Silent Hill film. Um, it's something I did want to mention because. I don't know if I would say it's necessarily a really great film, but I do think it did try to capture a lot of the tone of, of the games. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was relatively successful in that way. Um, it does actually have sort of a cult following, I've noticed, um, again, from some of the people that I follow on Twitter. Sure. Um, it actually has kind of a following. I mean, some people actually really like the film and really feel that it you know, evoked the right the right feeling for Silent Hill. Now, to be honest, I'm not a Silent Hill fan, mm-hmm. so I can't say for sure if that is accurate because I'm just not even a fan of the games themselves. Right. But um, I don't know if y'all have seen the film. I have actually seen the film. Oh, I, yeah. thought, I thought it was okay. Um, I can sort of see how it definitely tries to have a similar um, tone as the films and mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. capture that kind of survival horror-ish atmosphere. 
Well, that I think is one of the most important things is to make sure you get the tone right. Yeah. Because if you don't get the tone right, you're, you've missed. Um, I'd love for them to make an Assassin's Creed movie, but they will mess it up. They will absolutely mess it up. Mm. Oh, they uh, are making one. Are they? Uh, wait, are they really? Yeah, they are. How did I not know this? Just not on the internet enough, I guess. No, I guess uh, not. <laughs> um, but, okay, yeah, well, they'll absolutely mess it up. Yeah. They will focus on all the wrong things. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and what they really need to do is make it about the animus and the idea of, of you know, jumping around to time and not focusing on one specific, um, uh, you know, older character or anything like that necessarily. Or maybe they do. And, and I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They're going to mess it up. I get the impression that this one's actually going for transmedia in the sense that they're telling a new story in this universe. Good. Um, I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious about it. I'll have to read hmm. up. Read Interesting. Up more. Yeah, I don't know enough about it to complain about it. I yet. think. I think this one <laughs> might be about the Spanish Inquisition. Or hmm. I did that. not expect the Spanish Inquisition. Well, there nobody does. Go. Nobody does. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I guess to kind of round out this discussion because like, we've kind of touched on a lot of different topics, and I think we've kind of nailed that sort of feeling. But I think we sort of bounced around and maybe this, this idea, do you think it's necessarily a good thing that when films try to be more like a video game, do you think that's, or do you think it's just kind of different? I think it it needs to know what it's doing. Hmm. And I think that certain genres are more suited to have a video game feel than others. Uh, we, we've mentioned a lot, like I said, you know, action adventure, uh, Kung Fu, um, you know, anything like kind of hero's journey esque kind of lends itself well to that. And of course, not all games follow the same structures either. There are a lot of games I think, you know, we're not going to have films that feel like them because like, how do you emulate civilization in a film without like focusing on like, you know, maybe diplomatic drama or something like that. But then it doesn't feel like Civ because it's not about city building. You mean Sid Meier's Civ? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, you know, the, the, the film that feels like Sid Meier's Civilization, I'm not sure which one that's going to oh, be. Aside, boy. aside from maybe just, like, having moments that remind you of it, or maybe the aesthetic does, mm-hmm. but... Um, so I think, the, you know, a lot of the examples we have are, you know, kind of in that hero's journey style, competent protagonist overcoming increasingly difficult obstacles mm-hmm. in order to achieve a goal. Um, you know, that's, that, that is a, a specific subset of games that's also a specific subset of films mm-hmm. um but i think it's the ones those are the ones that kind of most naturally work together hmm. i look at it this way um storytelling is a fundamentally interactive process it always was you know we we humans we story told ourselves into existence we have beowulf and we think of it as being a sort of canonized experience because you know we've had got the translator seamus haney by the way best translator but um the truth is, whenever Beowulf was being told around Firelight, it changed. Mm-hmm. It changed because Ranulf was sitting over there, and he's got a big red beard, and we're like, ah, ha, ha, I'm going to enter him into the story. And everyone in the in the town laughed because mm-hmm. they knew that he'd just been portrayed as the villain, and that was fun. Um, and, and we don't do that anymore. Now everybody gets the exact same experience with Episode 7, uh, unless they went and saw it in 3D or IMAX uh, or whatever, you know? And, and, and that's, not, that's not how it's really meant to be historically. Some, some uh, kickstarts put you into the game. Well, and that's the <laughs> thing, is I think we've reclaimed something with this renaissance of video games and with this renaissance of role-playing games and that kind of thing. We're getting back to our roots as humans mm-hmm. of interactive story, of actually contributing to mm-hmm. the story, mm-hmm. of saying, tell us the one about the dragon, you know, skip that part and move on to the... Whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that whenever we we try to emulate some of... Um, so that part, what what you're really doing is, if you were to take, say, oh, uh, pick pick a game, Skyrim, right, mm-hmm. which has all these different things, and you go and you grab one Let's Play of Skyrim, you're pulling it up off a of a Twitch or YouTube, mm-hmm. right, um, and and then that we're going to just canonize that as being the one single thing, and then somehow because the apocalypse happens, all copies of the game are lost, and all other Let's Plays of that game are lost, and that becomes the only artifact we have left of Skyrim. That's the only thing we have to understand what Skyrim was. That's what happened to Beowulf. We had one copy of somebody who wrote it down, which was really, really weird. And that became our canonized iteration of it. So in film, we've got the same kind of thing going on with, with this. You know, we, we're, we're looking at trying to nail down these specific stories. We need to be nailing down the right stories or it's not going to work. Right. We need to be focusing on the, on the right elements or it's not going to work. Um, I think that these stories, these examples that, that we've, we've talked about today, uh, whether that be Running Man or uh, Scott Pilgrim, all work because they work as their own cool, 
excellent world and story and and and, and not because they necessarily could have gone other ways or, or felt a certain thing it's not about the the branching linear choices that are in it it's about the format it's about the way that story is told and it's about the that sort of keying back in to a mode that we humans just i mean we were kind of bred to like this kind of story well keep in mind too um and this is maybe a good point to wrap up on um these are also character stories any any yes. decent story yes. needs good to have point. good character um and you know you were talking earlier about the witcher you you found it refreshing that you have rounded characters you have a the person you're playing as is a character mm-hmm. and not just someone you're filling in and in a story where the in a video game that is pre-programmed. It's very very specifically meant to go a particular way. Here's the way we intend to go. This happens with Fallout and everything else, whether or not they want to admit it. Um, you are playing a very particular character, and yeah, you yeah. don't have the same open ended as you have in say tabletop RPGs, mm-hmm. where the GM can adapt the story to the characters. Well, that's very true. Um, if you're trying to fully pour yourself in, you might find yourself disappointed by something that doesn't define your character because you're trying to be something the game doesn't want you to be. That's true. And yeah. You get very defined options for what you can be. Right. <laughs> um, and so the, the four dialogue choices. And yeah. so, and, yeah. and you know, the Witcher, you play as this character. And so you have some, some ability to wiggle a little bit as this character, but essentially you're this character Good girl. Um, in film, we have no choice but to follow a character. Right. And so if you have really bad character, then you're not going to have a very good film. Yeah. It makes sense. Generally speaking, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I, I, I do think um, that focus on hero mm-hmm. is, is a big one, too. Because that's when you're playing a video game. At least if we're talking about, like you said, you can't really do civilization. But mm-hmm. a video game where you're playing a character, that character is, you know, your hero, essentially, in that game. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, you know, films that, that have that hero character mm-hmm. that is going to be, you know, going up against the odds, that's the, the experience that most people have, at least when they're playing mm-hmm. a single-player video game. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's our avatar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One final point that occurred to me um, relating to uh, the world, you know, that kind of this cool world that we have. Systems. If the movie has a system that we can come to understand in the same way that we come to understand systems and games, mm-hmm. I think that creates even just within us as the audience this feeling of it being like a game because we, we, we are learning about it and coming to understand it. I'm thinking of Airbender suddenly <laughs> within the context of how the magic works in that world. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of a thing. Yep. <sighs> that movie. Not that movie. <laughs> and the on, series. The series. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and on that very depressing note, thank you everyone for joining <laughs> us for episode number 76 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on movies that feel like games. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.